I am Sarah Forbes. I'm a practitioner student. I'm a ministerial student. And I am so happy to be here with all of you today, whether you're online or in person. Good morning. So I'm going to talk about surrender today. And this is a very tricky subject because many of you might know there's two meanings of surrender. And one meaning has a lot of negative connotations. We oftentimes can think of surrender as a moment where we are being asked to submit to someone or something that maybe doesn't hold our best interest. So that's, that's one meaning of surrender. And it's real. It's a, it's a real part of surrender. But what I want to talk about today is what I call active surrender. And so this is, this is a type of surrender that is a willful choice to relinquish control. A author and religious scholar, Andrew Harvey, said, Surrender is deeply misunderstood as an act of weakness. Surrender is the bravest and most lucid thing a human ever does. And that's why it is so precious to the divine. This is the kind of surrender that I want to talk about today. The surrender that takes courage, a surrender that's lucid, and a surrender that brings us deeper into our relationship and our awareness of the divine, of God, of love, of light. So this talk is about knowing when it's time to let go. And I don't know if there are any other control freaks in the room. <laughs> I am definitely guilty. <laughs> and so I'm going to share with you a little bit of my journey with surrender on kind of a smaller scale and a bigger, a bigger scale. And, and we'll go from there. So I'm a mom of two kids. I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old. And I am just coming over the hump of potty training with my older son, my five-year-old. And when I started out on, on potty training, I was pregnant with my first kid. And I thought, okay, let's knock this out before this other kid gets out so that I <laughs> can devote myself to my newborn. And I'm not trying to potty train a two-year-old and have a newborn, right? So, of course, that plan slapped me right in the face. And it did not go according to plan because I just finished training a five-year-old, potty training a five-year-old, right? So it didn't happen that way. So, you know, right before my little Elias came out, I was trying to, to potty train my five-year-old. And my husband and I were so excited. We got this little basket of toys, and we said, okay, this is only going to be for the potty. It's going to be so fun. I made this laminated chart where he could put icons on it, and he got a treat. <laughs> When all the icons were filled up, I am, you know, I'm, I used to be a behavior um, therapist back in the day, so I do these kinds of things. I make little laminated charts and stuff. They're all over my house, chore charts, everything. So we were like, oh, there's no way this isn't going to work. This is great. I've potty trained tons of kids on the spectrum. This is going to be amazing. I've got this under control. No. Nope. <laughs> I realized that I started too early. I didn't consider that it was too early, and my older son developed a huge aversion to the potty. And he's a sensitive, adorable, intelligent, wonderful little being, and he, with all his might, told me no. Nope. So, you know, school's starting. He's going to be, you know, time rolls forward. He's going to be four. We're putting him in preschool, still not potty trained, accidents every day. I'm also trying to raise a two-year-old at the time, and I'm exhausted, and I want this kid potty trained. And there's all these fears that are coming up. You know, he's never going to be able to go to school. If he does, he's going to get mistreated or made fun of because he's having accidents. Or physically, he's trying to hold it all the time, so he's going to hurt his body. So all of this is going on for me, and I am in major control mode. So I start trying everything. I try the three-day potty training. I try the five-day potty training. I'm reading everything. And then finally, we're getting to four and a half. Kids still not potty trained. I'm talking to his pediatrician. She says, all right, let's, let's have him just on a timer. You have to be really consistent with the timer. It's not going to work. I said, okay, timer. That's the way to go. Let's do it. I was extremely consistent. I even had my little three-year-old, because he's, you know, my little two-and-a-half-year-old, almost three-year-old, doing the timer with him, trying to get them to do this. And I had anxiety every time the timer went off because somebody protested. Somebody yelled at me. Somebody made me feel like I was the bad mom because I wanted my kids to go potty. And I had to do all kinds of songs and dances to get those kids on the potty. And I was exhausted. I can remember lying down at night crying. This is the potty, this is the potty training nightmare. I'm in the potty training nightmare. So finally, after a year of doing a timer, my kid's now almost five and a half, 
I said, something, we have to do something else. What else can I do? What can I do? So I'm crying, I'm crying, I'm like hysterically crying. You know that hysterical ugly cry that you do where you're like gulping in air? And I go to sleep and I wake up at 3 a.m. and I heard this voice saying, stop it. Don't do anything, stop. And I heard it really clearly and I got really clear and I, I felt really afraid. Like if I stop, if I don't do anything, he's gonna get made fun of. He's gonna hurt his body. He's not gonna be able to go to school. And I was really scared. And I thought, okay, I, I'm desperate. I'm gonna stop. I'm not gonna do anything. I woke up, I told my husband what happened. I said, honey, I think we have to just stop. And he said, okay, whatever you wanna do, I'm with you. So I sat my boys down that day and I said, hey, I know we've been doing timers. I know we've been doing all these things. We're not gonna do any of it anymore. I want you two to just go when you feel it and I trust you to figure it out. And they both looked at me kind of astonished and they said, okay. And they said, so we're not gonna be on timers. I said, nope, you're not on timers. And they ran and went and played. They didn't even give it a thought. Well, I will tell you, <laughs> about three or four days after that, my oldest son started getting up when he was playing and going to the bathroom on his own. Now this was very new for us. And I tried not to get excited because I didn't want to jinx it. So I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, he's doing it, he's doing it. So I tried to not freak out, you know, and I waited about a month of him doing it to go, babe, you're potty trained. And he was like, I am, I'm potty trained. And you know, again, what I did, I did nothing. I did nothing. That's how I potty trained my child, nothing. Now, for those of you who are grandparents or parents in the room who are trying to potty train, don't do nothing if that's not what is for you. <laughs> This is not parenting advice, okay? This was my personal struggle because I was trying so hard to control everything. I was being called into surrender, into letting go because it was part of my spiritual journey. That might not be yours. So take this story at face value for how it is for you. Again, this is not parenting advice. Now, back up a little bit to my 20s. I was out of high school. I wanted nothing more than to be a performer. I had been in musical theater, choirs, comp competitive choirs, jazz choirs. I had been singing since I was four years old. I had been doing musical theater and short films since I was very young. I was in bands, toured all over the place when I was younger. This is what I wanted to do. I believed, truly believed, that this was my purpose that this was my calling, then, and if I failed it, I was somehow not living up to who I was supposed to be in the world. So I set out in my 20s to do this. I did it for eight years, and at first I had a really good time. I was having so much fun. I was extremely prolific. I wrote tons of songs. I love some of those songs still to this day. I play them for my kids and we dance to them. You know, and it's really great, and I'm so glad I did it. But after eight years, I had writer's block, I couldn't write anymore. Showing up for practice with my band was feeling like a chore, I hated it. I wasn't excited about shows anymore. People stopped coming to my shows. I remember driving all the way down to LA to a show at Hollywood Bowl and I got, they moved us to the headlining position and no one knew us there. Does anyone in, who's in music know what that's like? Raise your hand if you know what that's like. You're, yeah, look at this side of the room over here, yes. So if you get moved into the headlining position and no one knows who you are, no one stays to see you. So I drove all the way down to LA with my band and played to like 10 people. It was crushing. I was, I was heartbroken. I thought it was our big break, right? So I decided that I needed to step back and I told my, my band that I needed to take a break. Well, that was in 2010 and it's 2022 and I've never resumed that. And that's okay. It's okay. I sometimes think about where I would be if I continued on that track, if I would have made it, if I would have gotten signed, if I would have been playing a lot of places, and those things may have happened. But what I do know with 100% certainty in my bones is if that had worked out the way my ego wanted it to, I would not be happy. I used to wish under tunnels, you know, you, make, you hold your breath and you make those wishes. I used to wish in tunnels that I knew true happiness when I was in my 20s. I was clinically depressed. I had a hard time do, functioning in the world. I would cancel plans often. I wouldn't show up to jobs. And so I was really struggling at that time in my life, and I wanted nothing more than to know happiness. 
And the music industry was not the way for me. And I am 100% certain of that. And I would not trade the joy, the love, the awareness, and the happiness that I have now for anything. And so I know when I hit that wall in about 2008, I know that I was being called and beckoned by something higher to take a step back and shift gears. That was one of the hardest points of surrender in my entire life. Surrender is not easy. As you can see in both of my examples, that it requires facing a fear or multiple fears. And it takes an enormous amount of faith. Whenever we are being asked to surrender, we are being asked to face a fear. I want to let you know that the highest reality of God is unconditional love. That is the highest ultimate reality. And so whenever we are being beckoned by our intuition, our soul, our, our you know, higher self, whatever word you want to use, whenever we're being beckoned by that to let go of something, we are being called to shift into that high reality of unconditional love. And we cannot get there without surrender. And it always involves fear. Because if we weren't afraid, we'd already be in the high, we would already be in the unconditional love. If we weren't afraid, we'd already be there. So every single time that we're being asked to surrender, we are being asked to shift into something higher, shift into a higher expression of reality. And this is, I've seen this time and time again in my own life. So if surrender is, is something that we're, we're kind of, using that negative connotation with, then this is not the surrender that I'm talking about. If we're talking about mistreatment or abuse or injustice, the highest reality of God is never going to ask us to surrender to any of those things, ever. So the surrender that is active, that is willful, that is lucid, that surrender is always about up-leveling our experience here on the planet for ourselves and for other people. And again, it always involves fear. With my son and the potty training experience, I was so afraid of all those things that I shared with you that he wouldn't be able to go to school, that he'd be mistreated, that he would hurt his body. Now, none of those things came true, but I had to get myself in my mind to a point where I was okay if they did come true because I wouldn't have been able to surrender, surrender if I did not. And same with my music career. I was, I was scared if I left the music industry that I would completely lose myself, not know who I was, and not have a reason to be here, to be honest. That did not happen. The exact opposite happened. But I had to be okay with that death of the ego in order to surrender. So surrender is scary. Surrender calls us out of tunnel vision and it creates a space needed in order for real transformation to happen. I came across a really amazing quote this week while I was working on this talk and I thought it was, it was so synchronistic. Eckhart Tolle wrote, you cannot transform yourself and you certainly cannot transform your partner or anybody else. All you can do is create a space for transformation to happen, for grace and love to enter. We create this space through active surrender. There is no other way to do it. Whether it's active surrender in a small moment or active surrender in a big moment, this is how we create that space for real transformation to take place. I really believe that it's through surrender that a portal opens inside of us and the divine rises to the surface to mend, to guide, and to heal. That portal stays shut when we're living in fear. I cannot sow seeds of love, as that song so beautifully suggested, if my actions are born out of fear. If I'm trying to control my little five-year-old <laughs> and my little three-year-old, there's no peace in that. And as you could hear by my story, I was dying. I, was in an, I felt like I was in a potty training nightmare again. So 
In the midst of chaos, in the midst of disorder and pain, we so love through alignment with the frequency of unconditional love. And we find that alignment through active surrender. One of the reasons I wanted to talk about this today is because the last two years, I believe, are a time of collective surrender. It has been a time of deep, deep surrender. If we've been paying attention, we are being called to rapidly change on like, what, a week-to-week basis, maybe a day-to-day basis? We're being asked to change and readjust almost daily, weekly right now. And it started in, in 2020, and it has just exponentially grown in my reality and and for what I see of the clients I work with and everyone else around me. So we cannot keep up with the ways in which we are being called to change and grow without surrender. I had the wonderful experience of serving on ministry in 2020 at this center when we were being called into surrender as a community, as a ministry. And from working in that experience, I can tell you firsthand that if this ministry did not engage in active surrender, we would not be here today. We would not be thriving the way that we are today. We would not have the global collective that we have today if we had not engaged in active surrender and had not listened to the higher call that was coming through as we were being asked to shut down. This happened to businesses and organizations and individuals all over the world. And those who surrendered thrived. And those who did not struggled immensely in a lot of ways. And so what I can say to you from working in this experience here with ministry and and just my gratitude in doing that is that we did not feel ready. We were scared. (laughs) We didn't know what to do next. We weren't like, okay, we got it locked down. All right, now we're going to do everything online. It's all ready. It looks perfect. We know how to do this. No. We didn't know how to do any of it. (laughs) We did not know what we were doing. I mean, it might have looked like we did, but we didn't know what we were doing (laughs) at all. And so we took it day by day, step by step. We surrendered as we needed to to help this community thrive. And there are examples like this all over the world the past two years. I want to share with you a quote by Mark Nepo. Mark Nepo said, Surrender is like a fish finding the current and going with it. I really believe that there is a divine current that has only our best interest at heart. And when we can get out of our own way, and listen to what the current has to offer, we grow immensely. True surrender is living in divine flow, and it is the only path to unconditional love. I want to say this one more time because it's so important. Unconditional love never calls us into mistreatment. Unconditional love never calls us into abuse, and it never calls us into injustice. So if that's what's being experienced, the type of surrender we are being called to in those moments is to advocate, to fight, to find the resources we need to, to move into love. And if any of you are experiencing that, I, I urge you strongly to get the help that you need to to move into a greater experience of love. Our ministry here, our practitioners here, are always happy to help. So what it is, what it is, are these sometimes day-to-day, moment-to-moment experiences where something isn't quite working and we feel like we're pushing up against something, like we're pushing a boulder up a hill. And in those moments, we are being called to look at what is going on underneath. So I want to share with you all a practice today that you can do at your, you know, you can actually embark on it now as I lead you through it. But also, you know, in your spiritual practice, in your time of journaling, 
I'm going to lead you now in just a small, a small practice where we explore some questions to help you get underneath of maybe some things that aren't working in your life, some places where you feel like you're moving up against something rather than in the current of divine flow, like my potty training story. So the first thing to do is to think about how, like, or what in your life isn't working. Not how it's not working, but think about what in your life isn't working. Think of an area in your life that's not really working right now. Just bring it to mind. And once you have that area in your mind, I invite you to ask yourself the first question which is how do I feel when I think about this? And if you have a pen and paper, you can jot down the feelings. And if you don't, you can just bring the feelings into your awareness. How do I feel when I think about this? And then in this same situation, Ask yourself, am I trying to control the situation? And as you're thinking about whether or not you're trying to control the situation, notice what ways you try to control the situation. What am I doing to control this situation? Am I forcing my child to go potty every 30 minutes on a timer? What am I doing? Just look at what you're doing. And the third question, and sometimes the the question that's the hardest, is what am I afraid will happen if I give up this control, if I give up these behaviors? What am I afraid will happen? And just notice what you're afraid of. And as you're noticing this, Can you find a part of you that knows that in the midst of this, that you're going to be okay? Can you find a part of you in the midst of this that knows that you're going to be okay? This is where we find surrender. And when you feel ready... Go ahead and open your eyes if they were closed. So this is the point of surrender. It's the point where we have faith that something higher is calling us to shift gears. Something higher is calling us to let go. And if you have any trouble or questions in this process of what to do next. We have practitioners available here. We have all kinds of resources available in this community to support you. We have classes that support you. If you have a therapist that you trust, I urge you to bring it up with your therapist. Talk about what you're afraid of in order to accomplish this level of surrender. And when you do... When you do surrender, when you do let go and trust the divine to catch you as you fall, know that you are up-leveling your experience. You are growing, you are rising into the highest reality of God, the reality of unconditional love. Thank you. Hi, friends. I hope that our message inspired you today. I want to give you an opportunity to pay it forward. We are able to do all that we do here. We're able to get this message to you wherever you are in the world based on contributions. We're a nonprofit. And so I wanted to give you an opportunity to do that, to pay it forward. You can click the link in the description box below or go to our website. No amount is too small or too big. We are so grateful. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Know that you are loved. Have a good week.